Testing, hello Ira. How the hell are you? Darn it. Testing, testing. <clears throat> you don't have to say that, I'll do that when I don't. Okay. I'll do that. Right up by. Okay. Let me just get a cigar, John. Huh? John Gallagher may could probably be a relative of yours. He was a coach in Scranton Prep basketball team. Check. Great, great coach. Big tall guy. Maybe about six three. Mm -hmm. Died about three years ago. So he would have coached in the fifties. Fifties, fifties, uh, and mid sixties. Ruby. Uh, Ira, I need two minutes. Yep. Well, my grandfather, his family, of course, you know, stayed and to this day is up in Scranton. He left in 1921. Him and his brother Bill he came to New York City, and uh, he met Nellie Cavallo, born in Naples. Met her on uh, the Lower West Side, and uh, they got married in 1925. And it was like interracial marriage. Oh, yeah. Families did not talk for 15 years. That's it. Now you got it. Yeah. Well, that's what, uh, you know, in, in some of the, the, the dialogue texture in championship season, I tried to get that ethnic mix. One guy Polish, one guy yeah. Irish. Yeah. <coughs> you Dago, you Shanty Irish. <laughs> so, I mean, it's not a bigotry there. Oh, no, no. It's, well, it's, a, it's a way of life. I mean, if a... I was just setting a couple of If the guy was running against them was uh, an Arab, they'd call him a goddamn Arab. Is that, you know, that's like the Scorsese films. You know, you see yeah. Mean Streets or, or, you know, or Taxi Driver. It's the same kind of thing. I mean, they, okay, uh, I'm ready. It's, it's a formal identification. It's not a codified bigotry. Yeah. You know? And up there is, you know, the patch where it's all forged. It's all, all Italian. Dixon City's all Polish. Mm -hmm. Scranton's got Polish, Polish, Welsh, Italian. Italian. And I went to St. Patrick's High School, and half the school was Lebanese. And that was in 1950. Huh. Lebanese are very strong up there. You know, they run all the like fruit. That. Yeah, they run all the fruit and produce. What's that? He used to talk about Christy Matheson. Yeah. The local. Oh, yeah, he's, the, he's from Factoryville. Right. Yeah, but there's a lot of great sports figures. Charlie Trippi. Right. This kid's Cephalo now from Miami. Nice. Munchak yeah. for Houston. Mm -hmm. It's a great sports area. Yeah. Of course, yeah. that's all they have. He's a boxing guy. Okay. Yeah, sure. Hey, Jason, it's been a 10-year odyssey for you in bringing that championship season from stage to screen. Could you talk a little bit about that uh, that time? Yeah, it's about, I'd say between 7 and 10. Uh, the first screenplay I did was in 1975. And uh, it has been a kind of an epic journey. It fell apart many times due to uh, the death of William Owen, uh, the catastrophe of a few directors dropping out of the picture, and the pervasive attitude in Hollywood that it would have to be opened up in the sense that the women would have to play an important part in the film. And I didn't think they had to. I wanted five men in male bonding one night, slice of life and abstract from that what you will. Uh, but I felt that if I started to get into the town, and into the wives, and into the girlfriends, uh, at that time, I don't think my talent would have carried it beyond uh, a road company Peyton Place. So I wanted to keep uh, uh, the initial impulse and integrity of it without filming the stage play, making a film. There was a problem on where it should be filmed. I, I could have had it filmed by, with Columbia and David Beagleman in 1977, 76, but they wanted to film it in California, and I didn't think that was right. I didn't think Pasadena was the proper environment, uh, atmospherically, mood, organically, for a championship season. I wanted to show a town that was passing, perhaps, into oblivion, and uh, not a town like Pasadena, which is a museum, almost. You know, it's permanent, it's solid. And so Canon Films, uh, Menachem Golan, Ewan Globus, saw the play in Tel Aviv, in Hebrew, about uh, two years ago. And it was a huge, huge hit in, 
in Tel Aviv, and they, they brought me all the reviews uh, in Hebrew and translated them. And they were very impressed by it, and they had none of the demands that the Hollywood studios had, none. They said, uh, five men, you want to do it on the East Coast and the West Coast studio, and your live material, when you open it up in Scranton, fine. And so they, they once they committed uh, with, uh, I suppose, typical Israeli alacrity, they went right to it. And we, we filmed in, we had one week rehearsal, seven weeks of shooting, three on the East Coast, four on the West Coast, and ten weeks of editing. And then we released it. Canon is now uh, really challenging the majors as an independent making yeah. strong, strong films. Yeah, they are. They're one of the, the, the most powerful independent groups in that they made their money on the uh, street pictures, on the mass appeal pictures, but always, I think, with an overall vision to do important work, to do uh, risk work, to uh, bring something a bit classical to the movies. Now, they've done Championship Season, and they've also done uh, Wicked Lady with Faye Dunaway. They're going to do Duet for One with Faye Dunaway, which is a good play. Uh, and they're doing, uh, I believe, Sahara. You mentioned the editing uh, taking 10 weeks. Very, very fast period of, of, of post-production for the picture. Oh, absolutely. Well, uh, the, uh, they said, G can you get it out before December 20th? I said, I think I can. Uh, and it was from, from the first day of roll in camera in action to when the print was delivered here in New York, two days under 18 weeks. Can we attribute that to the long gestation period? Yeah, and uh, you can attribute to an, an incredible cast. Uh, to my mind, a, um, a, 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 a piece of, of, of American uh, ensemble acting that uh, comes along all, all too rarely. A, a fabulous piece of, uh, of work by the actors. Uh, they, they, they played beautifully together. There was no, uh, you know, if one person decided to go on an ego trip or decided to play star, the delicate balance would have been tipped and we probably still would be editing it. But it, they submitted themselves to the material and indeed brought so much to the material in such a short period of time. A very intense period of time. Robert Mitchum, Bruce Dern, Stacey Keach, Martin Sheen, Paul Servino. How did you shape this dream cast into an ensemble in such a short period of time? Well, I think in a strange way, the short period of time helped us. Uh, there wasn't time for self-indulgence. There wasn't time for too many questionings. You had to go right off your instincts. You had to trust one another and trust each other. I think sometimes when there's too much, too, too much money and too much time uh, around a film, uh, you get into a kind of creative self-indulgence, or which then becomes a destructive self-indulgence. Uh, there's too much second-guessing. Uh, I think uh, uh, during championship season was like one week or two week summer stock. You're truly doing Stanislavski then as an actor because you go right off your instincts. There's no time to sit down and have long labored discussions on what the inner motivation is. You've got to go with what you feel. And this is what they did. So in a strange way, that time period, I think, worked for us. In the editing period, almost the same principle applied. How did the actors that played the former basketball stars react to working with an actor of, of the stature of Robert Mitchum? Respectfully, but uh, uh, there was a kind of a healthy irreverence as to what you need. You know, I was worried uh, myself with the entire acting ensemble that because it won a Pulitzer Prize, there's a tendency to get very reverential toward the material. Uh, there's a tendency to genuflect before you say a line. And I encourage them to uh, Im uh, improvise to a degree. Uh, create a design for an actor. I believe you've got to create a design for an actor. You can't let two actors go out there and say, do what you feel, do what you want. I'll just keep the camera here because it makes them very insecure. And it, it, I, I placed a design on it and I said, improvise within that and we'll get back to the script. We'll get back to the script. We'll get back to the words. They're not written in stone. Get the emotional relationships. Get the subtext underneath it. I'm more pleased if we get that. The words will live in the play. Any anecdotes you could tell us about Mitchum? Well, he's, 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 uh, he's from another school, and he played the coach. Uh, he, he, I believe him as a small-town coach. He didn't play it with... What I was terrified was, and I've seen this on stage, 
uh, slipping into caricature and becoming histrionic and chewing up the scenery. He didn't do that. Uh, his natural inclination to underplaying, for me, worked. And he had a certain patrician distance. Uh, he didn't play one of those hale and hearty coaches, whack, let's go, boys, which I, I, I didn't want. I wanted a certain dignity and removal from him because he is from another age. Uh, and he's a, he's a joy. The crew loves him. Uh, uh, crews really love him. But you must, with him, come in with an idea and with a design because he gets very skittish. If you're sitting there and you, the director or the cameraman, doesn't know what they're doing, you know, if you sit around doing it. And it was wonderful because there's a little bit of pressure there, so it makes you come in with uh, something specific. Might even be wrong, but at least attack it and, and evolve it and find out what it, where, where, where it's going to go. Uh, I remember one time he, he did a very difficult scene and he was, I think, very pleased by it in his own quiet, shy way because he's a very shy man in many ways. And uh, the crew uh, applauded him, and he turned and he mooned the crew. He did. I mean, everyone was struck dumb, but he did. And then they broke up into big thunderous applause. Stacy Keach and especially Bruce Stern in that championship season are really admirably restrained in their yeah. performances. I know that on film, the director has much, much more control of an actor's performance than on the stage. How, how does that relate to their, their performances in particular? Well, you know, Bruce uh, came to me and he said, please don't let me look bug-eyed. My career is, is in the toilet because everyone thinks I'm, uh, uh, you know, the great psychotic actor. Uh, I've done too many of them. And I made mistakes, he said, and I love this role, and I want to show that I have another dimension to people. And that's what I tried to do with him. Uh, I, there's a certain charm, there's a real charm to him, and there's a real adolescent charm. Uh, there's not that neurotic twist or that psychotic intensity that we usually associate with Bruce. He's vulnerable in the film, he's articulate, he's very funny in the film. Uh, and it, he, he wanted that. You know, and he said, shape me, watch me, make sure I don't step over into uh, what I consider something detrimental to my career. And Stacy, uh, to my mind, gives a magnificent performance in the most difficult role in the film. I mean, James is, has absolutely no audience appeal. He's almost a Cassius. And there's a kind of a desperate dignity that you know, Stacy plays him with. And uh, uh, Stacy brought that to the role. I don't think, frankly, the role of all the roles that can be most caricatured. He can be the villain, the Iago of the piece. And he played it with a kind of a sad whimsicality. And a, and a, a 43 year old tragic kind of whine. Uh, he's really pleased with the performance, and I am too. Martin Sheen playing the real outsider of the group yeah. and the alcoholic so many times in films alcoholics are portrayed in a very stereotypical wild incoherent kind of, of a way and his performance too uh, was subtle very subtle and we talked about that and of course Marty is a magnificent actor a magnificent actor and as he grows older he gets deeper and better as a matter of fact all of them do I think I think one of the beauties about this ensemble cast is that there are, there are dedicated craftsmen whose work is growing all the time, growing all the time. I mean, they may do the, the rent movies or the alimony movies as, as, as many artists have to, but when they get something good, it brings out their finer qualities, uh, the finest qualities that I think that they have. And Marty played an alcoholic, uh, the way I think an alcoholic should be played, not stumbling and falling down and throwing up and uh, incoherent, as you say, or slurring. Uh, it's that kind of steady alcoholic. Very, very steady, but trapped. And his, his wit never became vicious. His wit was a defense against what was going on. I mean, he was under the illusion he could leave that night. He had that illusion that I can get out of here anytime I want. I'm not like these people. I can leave. 
which of course he can't. And of course, Paul Servino recreating his yeah. Broadway role. What kind of challenges did he face, and how did you deal with them in terms of a role that, that he was so familiar with? Well, that was it. There was too much familiarity, and at the beginning of, of rehearsal, we caught it. He was trying to, and he, he couldn't help it, but unconsciously, championship season as a play changed his life as it changed all our lives. And so when he first started uh, our rehearsals, he um, tended. No, well, he didn't tend. He was. He, he was giving the performance he gave 10 years ago. And we talked about it. We had a couple hours of discussion. And uh, it was in terms of intensity and just volume was stage. So I said, Paul, just bring it down and bring it down. Just lower the flame. Just lower the flame. Lower the flame. Don't lose the fire, but just lower the, the flame. And I, I think he's real spectacular in the film. Jason, how did your experience as an actor aid you in directing your first feature film? Well, I understood their problems. You know, you don't, it's rare you have a film where five men are asked to be so vulnerable, to reveal so much, uh, because the, it really is to me, uh, underneath it all, with all the uh, religious connotations to the film, the stained glass laid in here, and the trophy looking a bit like a chalice, and a little bit of liturgical music subliminally, and Mitchum looking like a bishop, or like the Monsignor. Uh, I understood, uh, I tried to create an atmosphere where they would be, feel free to, to cry. You know, how many times in film do you see men cry? I mean, or, or truly laugh. I mean, ri I mean, a rich laugh, not a stage laugh. So uh, we stayed together a lot. We stayed together a lot as a group. Uh, and that chemistry uh, is mysterious. Uh, I mean, I, I, I can't take full credit for it. You know, I was there and I guided it and I shaped it as best I could. Uh, when there were problems, uh, I tried to solve them for the actor. And my tendency was rather than go with camera, I'd go with the actor. Uh, I, I set up all the master shots, but I really, uh, I, John Bailey was magnificent. Uh, he he uh, was an extraordinary help. And I stayed as best I could with the actors and worked with their problems, uh, which, as I say, was this in extreme privacy that uh, one had to make public for the camera and for the crew and for whoever was around. As a director, how did you go about creating the environment in which these actors could I would, rush forth with tears. Uh, okay. I would sit and I would talk to them, especially if Bruce had a heavy scene coming up, and we would rehearse it. I would clear the set, and we would rehearse it for an hour, hour and a half, until he felt uh, freer and freer and freer. Very much like you warm up an athlete. Uh, and I would talk to him and stroke him down, and we would design it, and then we would bring the camera crew in, we would rehearse it, then we would bring the crew in for marks and still rehearse it, and then they would, uh, Bruce would go away uh, by himself or with the actor he was acting with, and they would rehearse it. And I cleared the set, the set was always closed to everyone but the crew, which I think is very important, because you, I couldn't allow any kind of distractions at all, no friends, no agents, no nothing. It's just five actors and a crew. It was, in a sense, a, a group of men. There was maybe two women on the set. And I'd say, you know, counting the crew and everything, 75, 80 men. Uh, Paul uh, Servino uh, has his own way of, war uh, of warming up, and Marty has his own way. And I was very uh, uh, careful not to intrude on their private uh, uh, in their, their private uh, means of preparing. I mean, Paul would lock himself in his room, stay, uh, Bruce would run, uh, take a bicycle and go around the lot. Uh, uh, Stacy Keach would go in, he had an organ. Stacy had an organ and he would go in there and he would just play this, he had a synthesizer and he'd go in and he'd just play the synthesizer uh, before his big scenes. And I just kept away and I, then when they came out, the design was already there, and uh, we either fulfill that design or we extend it in the performance. 
Excuse me. Ira? Yeah. Can we cut? Well, we're still rolling. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. Okay, Ira? Okay? Yeah, oh, he's, he's, he's ever coming up is coming up, so it seems to Okay, so continue? Okay, sorry about that. The reunion in that championship season seems almost like a wake, a wake for their lost youth. It does come down to that, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Well, it, I think underneath it all, it's about friendship, it's about love, it's about friendship, it's about betrayal. The key is it's about forgiveness, because that's about all we can do to one another is forgive. We're not going to change flawed humanity. I mean, we haven't changed in 5,000 years, really. I mean, technologically, we have. But, I mean, there's as much savagery with a briefcase as there is with a club. I mean, I have no... I, my, my feeling is uh, the only thing that we can do that's really positive is forgive. Attempt to forgive. These men aren't going to change. It's not going to be any different tomorrow. I mean, they're going to go out and probably win that election anyway. By any means that they can. Uh, and I, I, I don't make moral judgments on them. I mean, I know a lot of audiences have, and perhaps some of the critics, but look, this is all we have. This is the humanity I see that we have. And except in rare instances can a man really change himself uh, substantially. And it's not to me about Scranton or a basketball team, uh, you know, the, or political corruption. I think it could take place in the boardroom of Columbia or AT&T or those impulses that are driving these people aren't just uh, selected to a basketball reunion in a small town. Uh, Scranton's a metaphor or an allegory, I think, for something larger, which I don't know what it is. I can't quite articulate it. There's an absence of women in their fraternal society, yet it's a woman who indirectly causes much of the right. dissension. That's Why right. was that? Well, I think uh, there, there's a lot of women in there. There's, there's, there's Paul's wife, who uh, travels all over the country with her mother. There's the, the coach who was in love with a woman and couldn't bring her home because she was Protestant and his father was Catholic, his mother was Catholic. There was, uh, of course, Bruce's wife. And there's uh, Stacy's wife and five kids. Uh, there is a uh, there is an absence of love and passion in their lives, yes. And that love and that passion and that brief moment was contained in that well, those last seven seconds of their lives. Uh, their fulfillment hasn't been family. Their 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 needs have never been satisfied by being fathers or husbands. They're constantly drawn back to the past. And it is, uh, in a sense, the power of nostalgia that may even give them the, the grace to go ahead the next day, to get up the next day and form a front against uh, an enemy who was trying to oust George from office. You grew up in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Can you describe the feeling the feelings you had in, in going back to Scranton to shoot that championship Well, it's season. sad. There was a bit of a sadness because it's a beautiful town. It was a beautiful town, and it's struggling, and it's fighting back, but it's really in a death struggle. And it's not only Scranton. There are 200 cities of 150,000, those mid-cities, that are vanishing, that are disappearing to the malls, to the, um, to the suburbs. The young are leaving. These towns look like senior citizens' towns now, 60, 65, or very young, but that made the best and the brightest leave. And Scranton is, is not isolated in this. It's, as a matter of fact, it's an, I think it's an example of, of a real dilemma in this country. These towns, are, their central business districts are deserted. No movies, out, no movie houses back there, no life, no no excitement in the, in, in the heart of the city is the central city. And it's gone. It's out at the malls. All the movie houses are out at the malls. All the, all the businesses are out at the malls. 
uh, and the towns are, as in, I, I tried to show in the film, when Marty takes that walk. You know, closed, deserted, for sale. Great old pieces of architecture gone. And, and in some cases, the king. Though I, I was not saying this is terminal uh, at all. I didn't try to say this is, I, I think it's a mood, and that's what Bailey caught, I thought. Uh, we talked about the motif would be Hopper and a little bit of faded out Rockwell. But uh, nothing so presumptuous to say that this is a disease that's incurable. I know that Scranton welcomed you and your company with open arms. Yes, they did. We couldn't. Do the film would not have been finished if it wasn't for Scranton. Could not have done it without uh, the immense cooperation and help from Scranton. And I used, I used at least uh, ten actors from Scranton, Scranton Public Theater, the smaller role. Mm -hmm. And they were very good, and they, and you know, the great faces, the, 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 the ethnic mix in Scranton is unbelievable. The Polish, Irish, Italian, Lebanese, uh, it has a, it's like the League of Nations or something. And the California people were, were astounded by it. And there's a, there's a rare beauty to it, and it's, it's very sad if it vanishes. As an actor, you've worked with directors like Robert Mulligan on The Nickel Ride, William Friedkin, The Exorcist, Ilya Kazan on The Last Tycoon. What did you learn from, from working with these directors that you were able to apply to your first feature? And what qualities do you think a director should possess? Well, he, uh, I think a director uh, should possess, he should be uh, articulate and specific. Uh, and I think, for me, the, the, that I've always wanted from the director, and quite frankly never got, was, is um, inspiration. You got to inspire the actor. Uh, enfold him and give him a sense of security so that he'll go as deep as he possibly can. Uh, and to do that, I think you have to be specific with him. Uh, you can't uh, uh, mince words. Uh, you have to know your material, uh, and it seems to me that the, the best quality or talent of a director is to get the absolute best of everyone around you, from the dolly grip to the actors, and treat everyone as a creator. I mean, it's a collective, collaborative art. If you stay there with a, in, 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 in people I've worked with, an autocratic distance, then I have nothing to do with them. They won't get the best out of me because I don't trust them then. I'll go to what, I, what's safe, what's secure, how I feel secure. But, uh, and that's what I tried to do, you know, uh, motivate uh, and inspire and shape. And listen to actors. The good actors can tell you a lot. The real good ones can tell you a lot. Uh, it, and it has been only my first time uh, directing a film, and I was blessed with uh, a, a, a rare cast. But I would, I would hold those principles uh, uh, in a code of how I would direct, uh, to create a, a, a line of communication that has, has uh, no detours in terms of ego or who's the boss or uh, uh, this is the way it must be done, uh, none of that, none of that. It's, uh, an actor does in, 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 in public what most people do in private. And he must be surrounded by a creative atmosphere, an understanding atmosphere, a tolerant atmosphere. And then you get uh, flights of genius. You, you were very empathetic towards your actors. I'm, I'm curious as to what your relationship was in working with your director of photography, John Bailey. Uh, well, John was, John was the painter, you know? And uh, he's one, to my mind, he's the finest uh, cameraman that I've ever worked with. Now that is not a great, I, I mean it's the only one I worked with, but I mean I, I did work as an actor with Owen Roisman and Jordan Cronensworth. I worked with some good ones. And John is one of the most sensitive, uh, sensitive in the sense that, uh, which combines an emotional response to the material and a very, very intelligent approach to how it should be filmed. And he is highly respectful of actors, highly, highly respectful of actors. He, they never, ever had to gear their performance for the camera. When he came in and saw the rehearsal, which was another thing I, I demanded on myself, that I would clear the camera 
And when we finally got the design on the scene, then the camera would come in and film the impulses and the design created by myself and the actors. And John was, uh, was brilliant in capturing that. Because you know some, some directors of photography, suddenly you find yourself acting for the camera, not even for the actor across from you. And that never happened. Plus, he, he has a wonderful sense of light and color, and he's so fast. What kind of homework did he do for, before shooting? Uh, we went to Scranton, John and myself. Stayed there for three days. I showed him what I thought were the possible uh, locations. We agreed on about 90% of them. Uh, and then, of course, he read the play, and he read the screenplay. And I think his, his, his in, uh, immersion in Scranton for a weekend was invaluable. He came up from New York, he was shooting here. No, and without a trace, I believe, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 What were the adaptation problems that you faced in turning your play into a screenplay? Well, I felt that essentially, if there was a visual philosophy, it was about the passage of time, and how do I visualize that? The passage of time on buildings, the passage of time in light, the passage of time in the house, the passage of time on the faces, and men's reaction to that passage of time. You know, the fear and the terror and the desperation that that uh, can uh, evoke in certain men, certain people. The sense of time's winged chariots at my back, as one of the poets said. I mean, they're... Uh, uh, so I, I look for things that were closed down, that once were alive. I look for uh, that coal breaker you see is the largest in the world, and now it's falling down. The railroad station closed. That huge school closed. The in enti entire center of the town for rent. Uh, and so that's basically what I did. And then when I got into the house, I didn't want to do it in one room. I wanted that house was another character to me. We were using the lace curtains in the house. The house itself was passing. He was trying to hold it together, the coach, but it's those old, great Gothic Victorian homes. And you saw a great influence of his mother in there. Uh, and his father. But uh, uh, all that, to me, was a, a kind of the visual poetry of the film. That would include some of the staging, uh, for example, on the porch. Yeah. The interaction between what's going on in the house and in rooms within the house and what's going on in the porch and then Sheen walking around outside, all yeah, of that. You'd hear voices. Uh, well, that's what I thought. I, I thought, I'm not going to keep cutting to people. If I keep cutting to people, I, you know, first of all, I'll get into a pattern of cutting that will drive people crazy and it'll become very distracting. And point of fact in life, you know, that's why I kept Marty inside when they're outside and Marty keeps dropping these lines out through the window where you don't see them, though. And Stacy addresses himself through the window. To me, I thought that was one of the best pieces of staging in the show. Because if I kept cutting back into Marty, first of all, it would have been abrasive and some of those lines would have been vicious. But this way, with Marty's, what I wanted was their reaction to what was said. And I do that a lot. It's slightly stylized, the film. It's not just... Um, uh, bedrock reality. I mean, I open with a stylization, the flag, and I close with a stylization, going down for the photograph being... But in it, there's a slight... When they go into the gymnasium and they play that basketball game, they go away, takes them in, there's a slight sense, a little bit of a crowd underneath there, so literally, when they, when they go through that last play, and there's a little... When it goes through the, through the net, some people hear it, some people know. Uh, and the coach's voice sometimes coming out of the ruins while they're sitting mix with the music. And I tried to tie, uh, the music is, Bill Conti did the music, and each man is an instrument. We, we use the idea of, <coughs> I said, let's make each man an instrument and see what you can come up with. Like Stacy's a clarinet, George is an oboe, uh, the coach is a trumpet, uh, uh, Marty is a piano, uh, Paul is the cello, and the town of the woodwinds high up, you know. The and so that when you look also at the trophy and you look at the coach, there's a slight identification, you'll hear trumpets muted in the background. Uh, we try to put things in it like that, you know, give it that density that, uh, that I think a uh, film can have. You actually rebuilt the coach's house on a soundstage? Sound? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Ward Preston, great piece, of, great piece of work. Yeah. Over in Zotro, California. 
And your costume designer has worked with some of the greats, including John Ford. Oh, yeah, Ron Tosky, yeah, he's fabulous. A very, very subtle piece of costuming for five men's suits. They were beautiful, I thought. I mean, it tends to think, you, you know, that's going to be easy, but it wasn't. When you were growing up in Scranton, did you have an authority figure like Coach Delaney? Well, we had priests, you know. We had priests at that time, and one seniors, there was a guy named Father Mulholland, and a priest named Father Egan, who had that that special sense of authority and endurance and strength. There was a few basketball coaches and a few football coaches, and I think the coach is a compilation based on probably four or five authority figures that I met, respected. Would that hold true for the, the other characters in the film as well? Well, I, a lot of those came from a lot of people in New York when I was struggling here as an actor. You know, because there is that sense of desperation, that sense of losing, that sense of perhaps slipping over the edge into oblivion, along with the town. I think that's why I, the play was very. I, I find that the play left was very enjoyable. Uh, people enjoyed it when they when they when they walked out for some reason. And I think it, there was a slight caricature in the play. And then you come in the close up with the camera. I think the film disturbs people more than it. I think they. I was talking to Barry Gray the other day, and he said he's been thinking about it for two weeks. He saw it two weeks ago. And perhaps it's one's age too that that. Uh, some of the lines strike a chord, uh, depending how old you are. And I think your sex also has a yeah. an effect on that. Yeah, yeah. What would you say was your most demanding role as an actor thus far? <laughs> Nick arrived. Probably my, my best piece of acting as well. Picture never made it, but probably. It seems to be one of those kind of neglected. It's a cult kind of thing. Now. It plays down at the Fairly. Uh, well, <coughs> they lost it midway through. Somewhere it got lost. Mulligan lost it somewhere. The writer lost it somewhere. The studio lost it somewhere. But it uh, it has that kind of cultish feel to it. On uh, working on The Exorcist, you worked with William Friedkin, who is known as a very demanding actor, uh, sorry, it's a very demanding director. Yes. What was Friedkin like to work for? Well, he had good qualities, he had good inspirational qualities, and uh, very, as, as a director, uh, excellent technical qualities. But uh, Ben let me go quite a bit, you know, because I grew up in that Jesuit milieu, I knew what it was about more than he did, uh, as much, certainly as much as Blatty did. And I lived, I went down and lived with the Jesuits for about three weeks, four weeks before the before we filmed, you know, I said mass and they taught me the rubrics and I went down where all the dead Jesuits put all their old clothes, you know, when they die. I said, what are the Jesuits, what are they doing all those black suits when the Jesuits die? And they took me downstairs in this Georgetown um, uh, uh, cellar and there were thousands of black suits and black coats and priest garb. So I went through there and picked out all my wardrobe, which I wore in the film. Uh, and there were a lot of changes that I wanted to do in The Exorcist, and he let me. You know, there was, I changed the ending, going out the window, that wasn't in the screenplay. Uh, the relationship with my mother I worked on, and he worked on. Bill's very creative, I mean, when he's working with somebody creative. We changed quite a bit of it, freaking in myself. And that undertone of Catholicism in, in that film is also very disturbing. And Exorcist, yeah, the Exorcist, yeah. Well, and the undertone of Catholicism in the championship season uh, uh, has been, you know, commented on by, especially the the, the interview from sports, uh, the review from Sports Illustrator was terrific. That's all he picked up. He felt the uh, championship season was a religious story. I mean, he went to some kind of profound allegory. Now, I never thought about it that way, you know. I'm just saying, man, we've got to get this done in seven weeks. Where's that? Don't worry about the allegory. It'll come later. Is he pointing to things like the coach's house as a monastery? Uh, oh, the, and, and the trophy as a chalice, and the stained glass windows, and a little bit of liturgical music, and Mitchum saying that he was going to be a priest, and he got the boys Jesuits to teach them. Uh, yeah. Could you talk a little bit about the ethnicity of some of the dialogue? What the, uh, you mean the, the, uh, the, what they called the, the racial slurs? Well, they're not racial slurs. I mean, you know, everybody is Scranton. You say you're a Wop, and you're a Polak, and you're a dumb 
uh, Irish moment, you're a Jew, and all. It's not codified. It's not it's because it's it's so intermingled, Scranton. I mean, there's no place like it. The Italians. When I, when I grew up, next door to me was Polish. I'm Irish, and next door to me is Italian. Down the block are Lebanese, and it, it, it's a way of defining territories. And point of fact, the intermarriage in Scranton now between Italians and Lebanese and Irish is uh, phenomenal. So I, I don't take that seriously. That's just part of the, the surface texture of dialogue. It's no, and they're not bigots, you know. Uh, here in this city, here is a lot of times here in New York is, you know, New York is a big Toledo, you know, when you really start thinking about it. It's unbelievable. And they, these, I guess you would, you would call them liberals who are kind of silly people, you know, smart and maybe articulate, but kind of silly. Right away, they jump on it and say, oh, these men are begging it and they're sleazy. And, you know, you're showing flawed people. If you want to show Burt Reynolds and Robert Redford, if you want to show some artificial perfection of humanity, fine. But uh, these people are, I'm flawed, you're flawed, the world is flawed. I mean, we at least must admit that. Uh, and maybe, maybe movies today, uh, it's only 50 years old. And so maybe today it is for escape. Maybe it is for the little green men. And maybe today we need it for escape and uh, not for penetration and for introspection. Maybe now it's going to become the servant to great effects. Uh, maybe technology will take over the movies rather than humanity. Uh, I don't know. You know, I, I think that uh, what I try to do is get is 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 use it to to uh, observe a human condition. That's all, without any kind of judgment. And uh, but God, it's a judgmental world. I'll tell you, you know. Uh, and I love these men, you know. Not because they're perfect by any means. I'd be a fool to think that. But they do overcome their flaws. Jason, they live with them. They don't overcome them. Growing up, did you have were your idols? Uh, Film stars, sports figures, religious figures. Well, everybody, every, when I grew up, everybody was into James Dean. Everybody bought a red jacket, and white jacket, walked around and looked brooding, and, and, you know. And, uh, and Spencer Tracy, I always liked, you know. Then James Dean, as I say, came along, and all of a sudden, you know, like 250 blue mercs were roaring around Scranton. And, uh, and Brando, of course. I liked a girl named Diane Varsi years ago, too. I thought she was an actress. I read a lot. I was always into Thomas Wolfe. The first, uh, and uh, what's his name? I liked I liked telling my short stories and Salinger, Edith Wharton, uh, uh, Dickinson, uh, Whitman. Uh, I had a very liberal education. Uh, and Chekhov, Tennessee Williams, Arthur Miller, uh, Cheever, people like that. You mentioned Arthur Miller. Of course, you portrayed Miller in the Maryland TV movie. Yeah. What was that like playing someone who was, was once you know, an idol? Well, it wasn't much of a role, you know. I mean, I, I you know, when you're doing that, you wish I, 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 I've always wanted to play as an actor, uh, play I, I, which I love is After the Fall. I mean, it, I, I here it got murdered, but I, it's a wonderful role to play, and I love it. And it is Arthur Miller, I mean, undoubtedly. I only had a piece of him to play, so I didn't really have a, I don't really have an opinion on that. It was a job, frankly. What are you working on currently? Uh, a bit of a play, uh, but right now, I mean, really currently is... <coughs> um, I've got two screenplays that I'm working on, and, uh, but I'd like to go away for about six months now and finish this play, I think, in it. And, uh, I don't know, I think, uh, I think I'd like to do a good acting role if a good one came along. Very hard, though. How do you feel now that uh, that championship season is, is, has made that that journey to the screen and, and after such a long period of time? Buoyant. <laughs> you know, and after a while, it was starting to become an albatross. And like everybody else, you wish you had six months to do it and six months to edit it, but when, they, when the time came, I took it and it's done and... Uh, I feel now I can get on to other work. I, it, it, it bothered me because it was being passed around in Hollywood and it was being abused. I don't like my material abuse. It wasn't being respected. It was played with and monkeyed with so that, you know, at times I can get, you know, I got into homicidal rages. And so this time it came by 
and uh, it's high tide before you know it. So I uh, took it and did it, and I'm very happy I did. Jason, thank you very much for being on the show. Thank Good you. luck. Oh. Thank you. Okay. Mike's. Can I get a few stills? Yeah. So I think we got a two-part show here. So great. That's good. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So maybe if we can even get some more clips, would be great. If we, if we I'm gonna see what I can. Oh, terrific. Can we just get one shot? Sure, guys. Come on in. Or? Yeah, come on in here. Come on in here. Right. You guys want to stand or? Let's play the humble part. Here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just before you did, I knew it's safe. Yeah. <laughs> what about the Dane Curse? Huh? We didn't oh, talk no, about the Dane Curse. How was that? The Dane Curse? Yeah, I don't know what you mean. Well, it didn't do too well on television. I know it's been on cable a lot now. I did it play in Europe? I became pretty good friends with Jim. And he, uh, as a matter of fact, he's coming in here, uh, I think, to do a movie. You know, you're, uh, I see a series doing it next month. Is he real? I think so, yeah. Check, um, Check uh, Bobby, 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 what the hell is his name, Bobby, his agent, the agency here. I'll find out for you. I'm pretty sure I read it, uh, that he's coming into a movie here with, uh, what the hell is his name? Uh, is her name? Susan? No, she's in a play. Maybe that's it. She did, oh, well, that one with Stephen Collins and, and you know, uh, Shelley McClay and all that. Yeah, she's that's not a play off Broadway now, Susan. Yeah. Was very good. Wasn't uh, Dankers released as a, as a feature in Europe? Yeah. Yeah. yeah the Private Eye. Oh, uh, really? Well, it's good. I think we got a two part show. Very interesting. Yeah, that was a particularly interesting. And you know, your comments on directing and acting. Well, you, you know, people went on that end here. Average viewer is aware of, you know, they think that uh, the actors just say the lines as they come out. Oh, bugaboo. Yeah. It's a bad one. It's a great. Good. Good. Good.